One Wire really is a wonder. I mean, what other interface can provide bi-directional data, device discovery, unique addressing, and device power all over a single wire? And to top it off, it's been doing that for decades, and it shows no sign of slowing down anytime soon. The genius of OneWire comes from the design decision to make it an open drain bus with a single pull-up resistor that serves all devices on the bus. Peripheral devices can draw a limited current through the pull-up to provide power to their internal circuitry, and during data transfer, when the bus can't provide power, they get their power from a local capacitor. This system, called parasite power, is one of the core operating principles of OneWire, is served well for low-power applications like silicon serial numbers. There are two factors that may upset this idyllic scene. First, with a passive pull-up, the time it takes to transition from a zero state to a one state is dependent on the total capacitance on the bus, and as you add more devices, that capacitance increases. At some point, that rise time begins to impact system speed and may begin to affect overall timing parameters for the one-wire protocol. Now, the second issue is that some devices just need more current than you can pull through a passive pull-up without violating logic levels. That leaves you with some oh, uncomfortable choices. You can abandon parasite power and provide external power to the device, or you can slow down its operations so that its power profile is more compatible with available current, and neither is a particularly great option. So, what do you do? Well, the answer is to make a few minor changes in the way the one-wire master handles pull-up duties. We're going to take a look at two of those today, active pull-up and strong pull-up. One solution to the problem of too much capacitance on the bus is actually kind of clever. First, understand that if you're using a fixed resistor for the pull-up and the bus capacitance doesn't change, the voltage on the bus as a zero state transitions up to a one state follows this equation. Now, notice that if we plot this out, the capacitance charges quickly at first, but it slows down as the bus voltage approaches the rail. Now the question is, how do we make sure that the bus voltage gets above the one threshold quickly enough? In this case, if the master is sending data to a device, it can turn on a more aggressive pull-up resistor, let's say about 50 to 100 ohms instead of 500 to 1000 ohms, just during the transition period. That dramatically reduces the rise time of the RC curve, and once the voltage level on the bus is close to VDD, the active pull-up is turned off. Now, it's a little trickier when the master is receiving data from the device. Now, remember how the one-wire bus works. The master initiates the bit time by pulling the one-wire bus low, and after a time, it releases the bus. Now, if the device is trying to send a one, it just doesn't hold down the bus any further. When the master releases the bus, the device lets the bus voltage rise to the one level immediately. But, if the device is trying to send a zero, it holds the bus low for a longer time and then releases the bus to be pulled to a one level. Now the catch is, the master doesn't know whether the device is going to try to send a one or a zero, so how does it know when to turn on the active pull-up? The answer is that the master just watches the bus. When it sees the bus voltage rise to about one volt, it turns on the active pull-up. That is, it lets the bus rise on the weak pull-up during the fast part of the RC curve and then gives it a boost just when it needs it as it's entering the slow part of the curve. So, how long should you leave the active pull-up engaged? Well, the DS2485, a single-channel one-wire master, typically turns on the active pull-up for about two and a half microseconds for standard speed and a half microsecond for overdrive speed. And yes, active pull-up is a feature of many of Maxim's one-wire master components. Active pull-up solves one of the problems we described, but what about the other one? 
making parasite power work for a wider range of applications. Well, for that, we need to dig a little deeper. For many one-wire applications, the digital logic in the device is really quite modest. If all the device is doing is, for instance, reporting its serial number, the internal logic is primarily static, and static current draw for most CMOS circuits is just about zero. But there are three applications in particular that may demand more power than you can get from the weak one-wire pull-up. The first is cryptologic functions. Now, these functions, and especially those that rely on asymmetric algorithms, require a non-trivial amount of computing horsepower, and that horsepower comes at the price of a significant electrical power requirement. It's not massive. I mean, we're nowhere near heatsink territory. But it's more than you can comfortably pull through a resistor of a few hundred ohms. Second, there are EEPROM applications. When you write to an EEPROM, you typically turn on a charge pump to generate the voltage required to push charge onto a floating gate. That results in a significant current demand on the system during write and erase operations. Now, once again, there's nothing getting hot here, but the power is more than you can get through the one-wire pull-up resistor. Third, there are times we want to potentially power external devices. For example, the DS28E18 one-wire to I2C bridge is designed to interface to an I2C device, power and all. To be as flexible as possible, you need to support devices that require more power than the one-wire bus can normally provide. What you need is a strong pull-up. Now, here's how that works. When the master sends a command to the device that it knows will require more power than the weak pull-up resistor can provide, as soon as the command is complete and the master has released the bus, it turns on the strong pull-up transistor. The device can start its current hungry operation, and when it's done, it can hold the result until the master turns off the strong pull-up and reads the result using standard one-wire techniques. But how does the master know when to turn off the strong pull-up? I mean, the, the device can't signal the master. The master initiates all communication. And if the master turns off the strong pull-up too early, well, then the device will be starved for power at the most critical point in its operation, and that operation will fail. That's why any Maxim device that requires a strong pull-up for operation lays out very clearly in its datasheet what commands require strong pull-up, when the pull-up needs to be applied, the exact duration of the operations that require additional power, and what the master should expect when it queries the device after the SPU period. Let's take an example, the DS28E18. It lets you connect an I2C device to a one-wire bus. You might do that to extend the range of the I2C device from one meter up to, well, more than 100 meters, and reduce the cable requirements from four wires to two, the one-wire I.O. pin and ground. Further, let's assume you're using the DS2485 one-wire master. Now, I'm choosing the DS2485 because it supports strong pull-up and it frees up my host microcontroller from all the drudge work of managing one-wire communication. Without getting into too much detail, here's how the system would work. The host microcontroller uses the DS2485 to send a program to a command sequencer that's built into the DS28E18. Now, for the purposes of this illustration, let's just assume that the I2C device we're controlling is a temperature sensor. The sequencer program would have all the I2C commands necessary to address the sensor and read the temperature. And it would also have a few other commands, one at the beginning of the sequence to turn on the power to the sensor, and then a second command to delay a few milliseconds while the sensor wakes up and gets ready for communication. And then at the end of the sequence, after the sensor has done whatever it is it needs to do, you'll add a command to turn off the power to the sensor. The program assumes that when it turns on sensor power, the one-wire bus will be in SPU mode to provide power to the sensor. 
Now, writing the sequence memory takes no extra power. You're just sending bytes to a RAM block, and that's a really low-power operation. But before the host microcontroller sends the start sequencer command, you set the SPU bit in the DS2485. That tells the DS2485 that as soon as the one-wire transaction completes and the start sequencer command has been sent, turn on the strong pull-up, and once that one-wire command goes out, there's no more communication between the DS2485 and the DS28E18 until the sequencer finishes its program. And how long is that? Well, it depends on the sequence. The timing for every sequencer command is given in the datasheet, so it's your job to add up the numbers and come up with the right time to turn off the strong pull-up and pull the DS28E18 on the one-wire bus. When the host microcontroller sends a command to the DS2485 to pull the DS28E18, the DS2485 automatically disengages the strong pull-up and clears the SPU bit, so the DS2485 had better be done with its work. Whatever data it received from the sensor is stored in its sequencer RAM, so the one-wire master can read the RAM and retrieve the data. And how much current can you source from the sensor VDD pin when the strong pull-up is active? For the DS2485, the answer is no more than 10 milliamps. But the good news is that for most modern sensor ICs, 10 milliamps is a pretty generous number. And what if you need even more power for your peripheral device? The DS2485 lets you synchronize its GPIO pin with the SPU logic to drive an external P-channel MOSFET. And with that arrangement, you can provide, well, pretty much any power level you need to the device. Active pull-up and strong pull-up make an already great one-wire standard even better by allowing larger, more flexible networks and more capable endpoint devices. For more information about this and the many one-wire devices Maxim provides, check out our website at maximintegrated.com.